Great, thank you. Uh, I just got the signal that our live streaming is now uh, working, and uh, we hope to have many, many uh, viewers online as well. So very much welcome to this second part of today's activities. We had a networking lunch in the Amazon room. This will now be the first of two seminars on forest, the role of forestry for sustainable development. And of course, we're all uh, waiting for and looking forward to the arrival of uh, their majesties, the king and the queen, for the second part of the seminar. Um, fortunately, I would say, we've been given some more time. So um, I immediately saw Robert relax when he realized that there was a bit more time for, for this part of the seminar. Um, if you haven't uh, figured it out uh, yet, I'm Peter Holmgren, Director General of C4. And I will speak a lot in the next seminar, so I will not speak more right now. My main job is to say welcome to you and to introduce the moderator of this first session, which is Robert Nasi, Deputy Director General for Research at C4. So uh, with a much more smart looking batik, I hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to speak very much, also neither on this one or the other, but we have a very good lineup of um, speakers. Uh, for this first session, that was supposed to start at 1 o'clock, and it's uh, 1.20 now, and finish at 2. I can, we can probably extend it uh, past 2, but we have to be really back into the room before 3, because, the, in fact, we are not going out to the room, in fact. We are staying in the room. But the, the, the royals are supposed to arrive at 3. So latest news about that. So that means that we have a, a little bit more time for the presentation, but I will ask the, the six speakers to, to try to, stick as, to <coughs> stick as much as possible to their 8 to 10 minute presentation, and we can have some time for discussion eventually and question at the end. So uh, I will not uh, speak speak much more on that. I will ask the first uh, presenter to come. Uh, we are going to, we are at no, we'll talk us about social forestry ambition in Indonesia. So, Bapa, we are at no. Please, Hilakan. <coughs> I think you have to come and make your presentation. I guess this one should go there. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think it's easier here because you can see the screen. There? Oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> Talking about social forestry and the three slides. In 10 minutes, <laughs> it is about 12.7 million hectares of state forest land. Uh, consists of production forest and uh, protection forest. Will be distributed to the poor families, villages around the forest, and uh, forest dependence communities. Uh, and we use the uh, proposed uh, map and we got 13.4 million hectare that ready to be distributed but have to be very careful but Pak President always mentioned have to be go to the right direction. Uh, this is the uh, PIAP, the proposed forest map for uh, uh, social forestry, this never happened never happen since we are independent. That there is a, a piece of land proposed for the, the poor people, 
As you know that we have 74,000 villages across the country and 26,800 villages located near or even in the state forest land. That is why there is this, uh, there is a program since, in fact, since 2010 started and now becoming very big uh, program because at least for one year we have, I have to distribute 2.5 million hectare. It is not possible. Of course, it's a big, a big program. I have to be honored and confess to you all. But at least this area is supported by ministerial decree number 22, 2016. And as you know here, we have a production forest and a, uh, social forest for social forestry. And then uh, the area without agrarian reform in the South Kalimantan, West Nusa Tenggara, Lampung, and Bali. And community forest system mapped by JKPP, Jaringan Kerja Pemetaan Partisipatif, this is from CSO. We also adopt their mapping and area for social forestry under process right now. <coughs> and also we map pitland that free from permit, meaning permit from Jakarta. It doesn't mean that in the in the field that is free from from occupation. That is the problem. The structure of PIAP you can see here the protection forest is 30 percent, meaning if the community get the permit, the permit is uh, about 35 years and will be evaluated every five years. 30 percent is under protection forest, meaning that they can only use the non-timber forest product and environmental services. And if they got the permit in the production forest, then they can cut the trees, but they have to plant the trees first before cutting. <coughs> and we also have a 20% of partnership in the, in the uh, HTI, plantation forest. If there is a problem, if there is occupation in the concession, uh, the Minister of Ministry of Environment and Forestry, my DG, have a duty to develop or to facilitate a dialogue for the local community, between community and the concession holders. This is the, the number that we achieved, 0.6 million hectare already proposed for the local community across the country, and then we give 19, almost 900, more than 900,000 hectare permit. And the permit right now is directly coming from the minister before the permit coming from the DG, from the governor and the Bupati. And we learn from that that only 20 to 25 governor and Bupati they gave the permit to the to their community before the minister gave the proposed area for social forestry and then followed by governor and bupati it doesn't work it didn't work so we start with the new regulation that they have we gave the permit directly from the ministry of forestry so the the community proposed the uh, the area and they will get help from uh, task force, we, pro we establish many task force at the provincial level to help community send the, the proposal. Also, we start right now in the coming months uh, online system for, for proposal of the community. The key success of this program is how far we can facilitate the, the poor 
to manage the piece of forest land and this social forestry area they cover from the tropical mountain forest to the lowland and we can see here uh, restoration of mangrove in Langkat is very successful yeah it is initiated by the local community supported by Walhi by LBH and other partners and also in the right side is uh, the hutan desa in Ketapang it is totally in the in the pitland area and it is habitat of orang hutan thank you very much Oh yeah, yeah, but don't don't leave, don't leave so quickly. I mean, sort of. <laughs> I think Our we. Our is finished. No, it's not yet finished. I mean, I think we 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 do have some time for questions. So if anybody has some question comments to make to Pawiratno for the social forestry program, we'll send the mic. Yes, Ingrid. Yeah, thank you very much. As you said, the goal is the 13.4 million hectare. And you said that so far, after two years, I think, you have distributed 1.7. So how is your plan and your vision the years ahead? How, how can we sort of all help and support this to, to move forward? It would be nice to hear your, your plans and visions. <laughs> the title of this presentation is about ambition. <laughs> Social forestry ambition. It is mission impossible. I said that uh, this year, that will be the first year that we can, we can distribute one million hectare, one million, more than one million hectare. Until now, we uh, start, we have uh, eight, 80, 800,000, to Ingrid, 800,000. Why it is, uh, <coughs> the process is, uh, is um, faster than before, because the process is easier. From the community, they send the proposal directly to the minister, NCC to governor and bupati. Before they need a recommendation from governor and bupati. And it is very tiring and unpredictable situation. Only 20 and 20, until 20 and 20 percent of bupati and governor helps their community to get the permit. In the case of HKM, Hutan Kemasyarakatan, getting permit from Bupati. And the permit, they got 35 years of uh, use right. Yeah. And for Hutan Desa, 30 from the governor. So right now, we don't need that. The important thing is our team is uh, the verification team from Jakarta and from our field office and helped by the task force at the province. The task force is a multi-stakeholder uh, task force. Member coming from CSO and from, from the governor staff and so on. And uh, at least in the next two years, there will be uh, more than four, four, four million hectare. And, uh, we cannot achieve 12.7, uh, something like uh, a magic number. Uh, but at least it is 10% of the state forest land. We should consider 12.7 is the political statement that never happened because it is 10% of the state forest land. We have right now is 120 million hectare of state forest land. And, and the and second one is the structure of the permit, almost 85% permit goes to the big and very big concession. That is the, the problem we, we face right now. That's why we, we start with the, the uh, partnership and the concession because a lot of concession like uh, Rio right now, Rio, forest and Rio 30% is, is controlled by HTE system. It is big scale. What about the community and Rio? That is the big question. Thing like this to Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel Ratno. One more question, or yes, please. Taufik. Thank you. Uh, I'm Taufik from Rai, but we don't know. Uh, this is great progress, and I notice here that there will be four million 
and more or production forest going production and protection forest yeah it's a production and protection but more of them like 4 million 11000 is production forest uh, this is going to be given to communities what are the status of the forest right now is it conceded to other concessions uh, currently or what is the condition of the forest are they already deforested and if it is then um, what will be the plan for empower communities to manage that forest and making the forest becoming uh, useful economically for them so that, that would be my first question the second is on recentralization of the uh, licensing scheme from district and provincial government to central government it seems that it's going to be easier because only one one gate one door one uh, to manage that but I just imagine that if we have like 500 districts and there are millions of forests going to be granted to communities, what are the capacity of the ministry to manage of licensing, verification and everything? It must be like endless job. And, and it, even it was before, uh, it was delegated to other government offices, it's still quite difficult, but now if it is going to be absorbed and taken up by the central government, it seems that it's like you give yourself a lot of things to do. So it could be slower than the plan, but I don't know. Maybe maybe something has to be prepared. Thank you. Thank you. You want to answer, Pawi Ratno? Yes. Yes. Once uh, we gave the right, this this map is already cleaned up from the all the permit from the center, from Jakarta. There is no permit at all from coming from Jakarta. But we check also this map to the government and Bupati. Sometimes they give the license to the area where we never give the permit at all. That is the problem. So we have to check this. Also we check whether this map is belong, is also the community or villages uh, are interested in, in getting the, the permit. Uh, and after the getting the permit, we have to help the community and so far it is supported by the CSOs uh, before and after permit. The community need a support, a facilitation on how to get the market, how to develop agroforestry system, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, there are many success stories, but still scattered and uh, at a small scale. What we think is we have, we have to be, I have to confess that uh, we need uh, to find the uh, and strengthen the networking, uh, uh, like uh, uh, local university, yeah? like in, in Lampung, the role of uh, UNILA is very important in developing this uh, social process program. Also in the role of UN ULM in um, South Kalimantan in developing uh, agroforestry uh, to, to solve the problem of grassland. It's very successful with the rubber uh, agroforestry, fish agroforestry and there. So there is a need, it is, that is why it is a collective program, it is a collective action. So whoever, uh, whoever interested in the, this program has to join and help us. It is not a program of the government. And we don't want to use this a project. This is a movement and this is a new way of looking at this forestry, how to manage the forest in Indonesia. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much, Fabi Rano. It's a very interesting and impressive uh, issue of social forestry. I think we are going to move to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, who is nobody else than uh, Terry Sunderland, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he, we will move the pad so that he can use the, because I have, it seems that I have created some problem Terry will speak about forest, food, and nutrition. Eventually. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Welcome. And thanks for the switch. 
Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real joy to be able to share our work on forest and food security. Um, not quite the nascent theme uh, that it was a few years ago, but um, we uh, have generated um, a lot of evidence on the links between forest and food security. Uh, and at the end of the talk, I'll acknowledge the, the, the work of the team uh, involved. Um, but basically, I'm going to provide uh, an overview of the work that we do and some of the evidence which shows some very nice, neat linkages between forest and food security, both at the direct provisioning level, but also in terms of ecosystem services. But first, some, some background information, if you like. So we're, we're, we're fully aware that a, a lot of people rely on forest and food security, forest rather, um, for um, consumption and income in some way. Forest dependence is, is uh, defined in many, many different ways. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not wholly um, saying that 1.3 billion people rely on forests in, in, their, in, in entirety in terms of their, their income and, and food consumption. But in some way, there's a relationship between uh, people, forests, uh, income and food security. Um, forests provide a very important safety net in times of agricultural vicissitudes, particularly um, as we enter uncertain times with climate change and how that's affecting our uh, tropical agriculture in particular. And the little widget is not working. There we go. We're going to gather all of them at once. Uh, work that Robert has, has been leading um, has shown that uh, uh, meat and freshwater fish play a very important role in terms of micronutrients um, and also great contributions towards the nutritional diversity of many forest communities. 75% of the world's uh, forest proximal people still rely on primary health care plants for, medic uh, for medicines um, uh, and animal products for, for <coughs> direct health care, which is a very important number. Um, and much of that um, um, primary health care has entered the mainstream, if you think of Chinese medicine, for example. Um, so we're, we're talking about a very high value and high efficacious uh, means of, of primary health care. Um, we know that between 40 to 80% of the world's food in the tropics is grown in smallholder systems, which are particularly diverse and much more resilient. I'll touch on that in, in a second, in a later slide. And one thing that we're very keen on pr promoting, and this is where our collaboration with ICRAF comes in very nicely, is there's a long tradition of managing forests for food. If you think of shifting agriculture, for example, uh, agroforestry uh, and trees on farms play a very important role in tree um, and, and other um, food product production. Um, and also, uh, I think another side I'm going to touch on is the issue of forest sustaining agriculture. How do forests and trees play a role in supporting the agricultural systems that we're all um, used to and are so pervasive here in the tropics? So we know a lot uh, about NTFPs, non-timber forest products. We know that non-timber forest products contribute significantly to the incomes and, and dietary diversity of many, many people, as I, I touched on in the first slide. Robert's work has shown this rather palatable uh, bucket of bushmeat, um, how important bushmeat, um, the role of bushmeat in providing micronutrients and other important um, vitamins and minerals that other um, NTFPs, for example, uh, don't provide. We know that people in forest basins, down at Suntarum, the Amazon, uh, and elsewhere in these large river basins, that fish play a very important role in diets and, and food security. What we don't know is how these are all linked, and this is the, the, the basis of a lot of the research we're doing at the moment, is the effects, effects of seasonality, how does off-farm income influence the relative values of these particular resources, um, agriculture, and rights and access. And I'll touch on rights and access in the, the, the last slide. It will be my, my last word. So basically looking at those relationships and, and how important they are. And these actually change uh, given a particular landscape context. So the, the evidence, um, one thing that um, we were challenged to do when we first started to work on forest and food security was, was to think about data. Um, it's all very well saying yeah, NTFPs are important, multiple forest use is important, but do we have data? So um, we uh, undertook a very uh, in-depth data analysis in Africa, looking at 21 different countries, looking at the demographic health da uh, survey data from the USAID and overlaid that with MODIS um, uh, remote sensing data and found a relatively strong-ish 
correlation between dietary diversity and tree cover. That was published in 2014. We also found that um, forest foods contribute significantly to, to all the food, food groups um, in many of the forest areas that we've been working in. <coughs> and that data was, was basically uh, focused on the Poverty and Environment Network uh, database, uh, 8,000 households uh, in 29 different countries. So fairly substantial amounts of data generating the evidence that we're uh, publishing. Um, and in Indonesia, we found a, a, a nice correlation between the nutrient transition, particularly with conversion to oil palm. Um, the sort of pervasive paradigm is that trans, um, transferring to oil palm, uh, or, or converting forest to oil palm, um, allows a certain level of income to enter uh, the livelihoods of, of many people, which it does, no question. But the problem is, is that that also drives a nutrient transition, um, which essentially um, transfers, if you like, uh, a dietary simplification uh, away from a, a more diverse diet. So people are, are actually relying on high-fat, high-carbohydrate foods, and it's been called the endomiization of the diets of, of, uh, of Indonesia, basically moving to much more simplified foods based on the availability of income. And in terms of forest-sustaining agriculture, we've been doing some work on, and everybody will recognize that, um, that uh, particular structure. Robert, can you remember what that is? It's the male flowers of oil palm. Now, oil palm is a very complex uh, um, uh, plant. It's uh, basically originated in West Africa. When it was first introduced to Asia, uh, there were pollination problems with oil palm. So oil palm had to be pollinated by hand. And you can imagine how expensive and, and time consuming and labor intensive this is. In the early 1980s, a team from uh, Malaysia went to Cameroon and actually uh, collected uh, and propagated uh, a beetle that which was responsible for the pollination of oil palm in, in West Africa, brought it to Malaysia and tested it in some of the plantations, and yields increased two or three times. The big issue with this um, uh, particular uh, euglossine beetle is that it likes forest. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the further away you get from forest, pollination actually drops off. And we're working with two or three uh, oil palm companies, uh, with Doug Scheel and, 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 and other um, uh, people, looking at what is that relationship? What is the optimum landscape configuration which optimizes pollination, but also makes sure you have a, a reservoir, a residue of forest within your plantations? In terms of uh, the work in Sulawesi, uh, Ravi mentioned during the, the poster session, um, we found that um, in areas of higher forest cover, pest control was actually greater, healthier cocoa, um, and again, something that that's has a great management uh, implication. Water regulation, we're all fully aware of the watershed importance of forests, um, and particularly for agriculture. Uh, work that we've been doing in Ethiopia, which I'll touch on uh, in the, the last little quarter there, um, also shows us how important watersheds are for not only um, uh, tree crops, but also for cereal crops in particular. And here we are, we're working uh, with CIMIT on the relationship between um, wheat yields and forest patches in southern part of Ethiopia. And we're finding again that yields drop off significantly uh, the further away you get from forest patches, primarily due to climate regulation. And again, this is the relationship that we're building with CIMIT to actually test what are basically the best landscape configurations in terms of forest trees and agricultural production. So not basically putting all your eggs into one basket, you, you only grow wheat and, and don't think about the forest, it's actually looking at much more agro-ecosystem approaches to forests uh, and food security. So in terms of uh, a, a sort of more holistic message, I mean, look, we're, we've been sort of relegated to about five or six slides here. I could talk about this for days sadly, um, but um, basically uh, w w we're, we're really promoting the fact that more diverse um, agroecological systems really do make a huge difference, uh, both because of adaptability and resilience, but it's, that's also not only from the environmental perspective, but also the economic perspective. So diverse systems tend to be much more economically resilient and much more environmentally resilient. Um, the ecosystem services function of forests and agriculture um, we've done a very extensive systematic review that's published uh, earlier this year, which shows there are some very strong relationships, and I've given you some examples here, between forest trees 
and, um, and agriculture. And we like to term it as the forest sustaining agriculture in many respects. And that's starting to gain traction. The more evidence we generate, uh, many of the other crop centers are starting to understand these linkages. And we're talking about, they are talking about systems approaches to, to improve food security, which is a, a, a great difference and a great advance in many respects in the thinking from the last few years. And managing landscapes on a multifunctional basis, that's where, uh, as Robert mentioned, the linkages between sustainable landscapes and food security come into play. And I think that's extremely important in, in, in the way we're thinking about these systems approaches um, and how we can integrate forests and agriculture and get away from the siloed mentality that's characterized both disciplines in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, but obviously we have to be somewhat sanguine. Nobody's saying forests and trees alone will su really supply the world's global food, um, and that's not what we're saying at all. But instead of being sidelined completely, uh, we'd like to see forests and trees integrated in much more holistic ways in, in achieving global food security. There is a, a, a paradigm that I think needs to be challenged, this linear understanding that more people equals more f the need, need for more food, which results in further deforestation. I think that needs to be challenged. I think we, as an institution and, and, and as a, uh, a consortium, particularly within FTA, are in a very good position to challenge that paradigm, and I think that's something that we'll think about as the next stage of our research rolls out. And the final point I want to make is we're generating all this evidence that um, forests and trees are very important uh, for food security. How does that play out in protected areas? How does that play out when we're showing that people need access to forests and trees? Um, and the basic right to food, which is in, in, enshrined in many, many human rights uh, declarations, how does that play out in the conservation arena? Um, and recently I was presenting some of this work at USAID, and this was extremely sensitive um, about the issue of access and the right to food, because if you've got that dichotomy between the need for um, conservation, which restricts access, but the right to food, which promotes access uh, to forest resources. Um, I think I'll stop there, but I will ask the SLF team who are here, and there's many of you here, just to stand up and take a little bow and a, and a, uh, a round of applause for all the work, because <laughs> this work represents a very good team effort. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I think we can allow one question. If there is one after this comprehensive presentation. If not, everybody seems to have been mesmerized by Terry. <coughs> uh, we can move into a totally different domain, I would say, which is uh, the private sector and uh, with a presentation about IKEA. So I don't know if you should say IKEA, IKEA, it's probably in Swedish, it's, what's the right way to do it? IKEA. Uh, and it's uh, Mr. Um, uh, Danang Ariraditya is going to present IKEA, please. The floor is yours. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Danang Ariraditya. I'm working for uh, IKEA Supply as a wood supply and forestry specialist. Uh, it feels great uh, to meet all of you here in this very special occasion. So this afternoon I would like to share a little bit information regarding how we are in IKEA working with wood and forestry in general. Why wood? Because actually most of the IKEA products, actually more than half of the IKEA products are made of wood. So I think it's very interesting for me to share with you all uh, how we work with wood and forestry. Okay, so in IKEA, responsible forestry is actually uh, our norm, meaning that we go beyond our own needs for wood used in uh, IKEA products, striving for responsible forestry to be our norm. So it's actually meaning that uh, we are not only concerned about uh, raw materials that goes only into our supply chains, but actually we want to promote something that is beyond that, that is actually we want to promote the responsible forestry for the better uh, good of the planet, for the people and for the planet. And actually, by doing that, we believe that we actually also contribute to end the deforestation. 
And in IKEA, we have our goal that all wood and paper used in IKEA is actually coming from the more sustainable sources in 2020. And actually, 1st of September 2016, we even have our goal that uh, when we are sourcing raw materials, it's actually when it's sourced from the, high, uh, from the countries where it's uh, considered as high risk for the illegal logging, everything must come from the more sustainable sources. And what we define as a more sustainable sources is actually Forest Stewardship Council or FSC certified or recycled wood. We, in order to achieve our goal, actually, we are working together with our partners uh, in different parts of the world, such as WWF and Rainforest Alliance. For example, with WWF, uh, IKEA have been contributing to the development of the 35 million hectares of FSC certified forests uh, in different parts of the world, mainly in Russia, China, and in uh, Romania. And then we are aiming, actually, for another 15 million hectares by 2020. Um, when we are actually uh, manufacturing and sourcing our, uh, manufacturing the IKEA products, actually we are uh, manufacturing in different regions, in different parts of the world, such as in Southeast Asia. And actually, it's not us who manufacture our products. Actually, we are working with our suppliers, uh, meaning that uh, external uh, wood processing company. In IKEA, we, in Southeast Asia, we are actually working with uh, a lot of suppliers, mainly actually in Vietnam and Thailand as the second country. And then we are working mostly uh, with Acacia. I think it's more or less uh, around 42% of the total species used in IKEA products from Southeast Asia is actually uh, acacia, and then the second species is actually rubber wood. Uh, main manufacturing countries, as I mentioned, is actually in Vietnam, and also when we, when we talk about the wood origin, it's actually also from Vietnam that becomes the biggest volume, and then also Thailand comes as the second country. In IKEA, we are not using any wood uh, from the natural forest or high-value tropical timber. We are always sourcing from the plantation and smallholders land. And unfortunately, actually, we are only uh, sourcing a very small volume from Indonesia. I will talk a little bit more here in, this, in the next slide. Uh, I talked uh, before, it's about that, uh, what is actually responsible forest management because this is also one of the most important factors of wood sourcing. And then uh, we see that actually FSC as a global certification scheme also playing an important role because they are global, they are transparent, they are multi-stakeholders and then uh, they also get uh, recognition from different uh, stakeholders and also the credibility. So we see that actually FSC is aligned with our, uh, in IKEA, with forest policies, uh, forest uh, positive strategy. And we can see here that in Indonesia, especially when we talk about plantation, it's actually only limited number. Or when it, we talk about FSC FM certified plantation, it's actually we have a very uh, small certified forest in Indonesia. So this is one of the challenge for us to source domestic locally in Indonesia. But on the other hand, uh, we also think that small holders are actually also viable part of the IKEA supply chains because uh, small holders actually represents a big proportion of the world's forest supply. So in IKEA, we determine to ensure that uh, small holders become a part of IKEA supply chain, they can still have uh, access to IKEA supply chains and become a viable part of IKEA supply chain. Mm -hmm. And we actually also work with different stakeholders, with different organizations in Indonesia and other countries, how then to involve more stakeholders in our supply chain as well. And then the next one is also good governance, uh, which is of course very important. We need uh, uh, legislation to be in place and then we also need all stakeholders actually fully informed and then about the, about the legislation and also the government as well we need 
that they also have to enforce the legislation. And then uh, when we talk about the legality, legality is also a prerequisite uh, before we start up our business with IKEA suppliers. Like for example, when we have IKEA suppliers in Indonesia, we always uh, ensure that uh, SVLK, because it's also mandatory for Indonesia, so SVLK is also part of the legal requirements when we are sourcing from Indonesia as well. And then, uh, yeah, uh, as at the end of uh, this presentation, uh, I just want to say that uh, we wish to source more FSC certified woods because obviously we want to develop our wood business in Indonesia. That's the clear message. In, in, in Indonesia as well, we, we are actually planning to open up more stores, for example. And then globally, also we also need also some volume from our region as well. And Indonesia, we see that we believe also that Indonesia can, al can also contribute to our uh, uh, business growth. And on the other hand, we also want to uh, have an enabling business environment to develop with business Indonesia. So sustainability is number one. On the other hand, we need uh, to ensure that we have a quality in place. We have the stable su uh, supply in place as well. We have a good uh, infrastructure as well. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Padanang, for this very interesting uh, mm. view of a big uh, retailer. Yep. I, have, I have one question, if I, if I can, I sort of, from the Indonesian perspective, I mean, sort of, there may be only very few FSC certified acacia plantation, but there's a significant amount of FSC certified teak plantation. Yeah. There is also a significant amount of smallholder plantation in Sengon Parasariantes. To which extent IKEA is willing to change some of this type of wood that it is using in this process to get more wood from Indonesia? Yes, uh, if we talk about the Parasariantes or Sengon, actually, of course, it definitely it's uh, very open that it can be also species in our supply chain. We actually use uh, this species in the past, but then uh, the thing is that for this FSC certified Sengon in Indonesia is quite limited, and then we actually, our wood volume is huge when we talk about the volume, so we need more to develop this uh, certified, uh, for example, for Acacia. But, ac but actually, we are also working with uh, different partners as well to actually to develop a local species that has potential for growing. And regarding the tick, actually, the thing is that uh, tick, uh, we are not using high value tropical timber, and then tick is considered as one of the species, actually. And then in IKEA, uh, we know that uh, we want that the products is actually for the many people. And then we, at this moment, we do not see tick as part of the IKEA range in, in IKEA product because the price is one thing that is very, very high, I would say. Then when we talk about IKEA, it's actually we are not really on, we are not really uh, selling a uh, high price uh, mm -hmm. end product, finished products. Thank you. I'm sure that Pawi Ratno will be interested to talk to you about the social forestry and the plantation from a small order. One question more for Pardon? Yes, Didi. Thank you. My name is Dede Rohade. I am from C4. Uh, you know that uh, you say that the smallholder is important in IKEA portfolio. And what we know that certification for smallholder particularly, it's not very easy. So yeah. do you have uh, any strategy, specific strategy to uh, progress more certification from smallholders? For example, some companies are also supporting yeah. the certification process for smallholders. Do IKEA will have the same strategy? Thank you. Yes, actually we are uh, actively discussing with uh, different uh, our partners like uh, FSC for example. We keep going uh, actually giving input to FSC regarding these uh, small orders for example to ensure that uh, because at this moment we do not really see like uh, small orders becoming part of the FSC certification. I mean if we compare to the large scale plantation we see that small orders only hold like a very small portion of the FSC certified uh, forest. So we want to uh, emphasize this, we keep actively discussing with FSC to give some inputs so that 
small holders can also be certified under the FSC certification scheme. But other than that, actually, uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, because IKEA is also a better everyday life for the many people, so it's not only a big uh, player can take a benefit, but we want to ensure that all people in our supply chain also get the benefit. So we seriously think that small holders should be also part of the IKEA supply chain. We are working with different stakeholders, different organizations like Rainforest Alliance, FAO as well, to even though they are not part of the certification, but we want to define what is the criteria under the definition of, let's say, sustainable small holders land, even though they are not going for FSC certifications or any certification scheme, but still we can define ourselves with the support of uh, other uh, organization that we are working together. And then next, our goal is that when we have this, uh, you know, definition, then we will include them in our definition of more sustainable sources. Thank you very much, Padanang. Thank you. Now we are going to have a presentation from another uh, large manufacturing uh, packaging company. Uh, Pareza from Tetra Pak, Indonesia, is going to talk about this company. Hello, good day everyone. My name is Reza Andrianto, and I'm the Environment Manager for Tetra Pak Indonesia. It is an honor to be here and representing my company to present uh, our company value with the title of Leadership in Sustainable Business to all the audience. So to start the presentations, as some of you might already know that Tetra Pak business has been here in Indonesia for more than 40 years. Tetra Pak brand promise is protects what good. We protect people, food, and future. Our founder has a powerful principle. He said that a package should save more than it costs. And this is really reflected in our use of paper as renewable resource and sustainable source, which is the main component of our packaging offering. Therefore, sustainability is our foundations since the beginning of the business. We drive environmental excellence across our whole value chains with three main corporate objectives. So the first one is develop sustainable product. As our packages are made from 75% renewable resource with the ambitions to be 100%. That is why we are committed to responsibly sourcing by using sustainably source, oops, sorry. Okay. By using sustainably source, paper board, and aiming to achieve 100% FSC Forest Stewardship Council certifications. Second, increase recycling. As we bring our global experience and try to apply it to local solutions by driving carton recycling, initiative, and technology transfers. Recycling is not our main business, but it is our business to make recycling works. In Indonesia, we work with three uh, collection partners and two paper recyclers, customers, retailers, government, school, NGO and other environmental partners. In fact, last year, we have received an award from Forestry and Environment uh, Ministry for the initiative in recycling programs. 
and third, reduce our environmental footprint across the value chains by capping our climate impact at the level of year 2010. So we are part of the Paris Place for Actions to limit our global warming impact and in addition, we are also have committed to increase our renewable electricity. Today, more than 30% of our operations use renewable electricity and aiming to be 100% across our global operations by the year of 2030. In fact, we are the first company in food packaging industry with science-based target approved. We commit to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our operational by 58% in the year of 2040 and reduce greenhouse gas emissions across the value chain by 16% per unit revenue in 2020. <coughs> So innovations is the key to address new and emerging customer needs, staying competitive and doing business in a sustainable way. We take into account for social, environmental and ethical considerations as well as cost, quality and delivery time. We are really working to minimize our environmental impact across the entire value chain. So by supporting recycling, we protect natural resources and reduce climate impact. So that's all my presentations. To learn more about our sustainability business, you can visit our website in www.tetrapack.com. Thank you. Thank you, Parisa. <coughs> A few questions, maybe. No? I have one, I mean, sort of, <coughs> in Indonesia, what's, what's the part of the, the paper that you are using that is sourced locally and from where? Okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, we have been here for more than 40 years, as I said in the beginning, but uh, there is no uh, converting factory. This is what we call, uh, in using the terminology, for the one that uh, producing the packaging material that finally supply to customers. So. We are open to any uh, uh, supplier, for example. It is our uh, paper board that supply to our converting factory. So uh, the nearby uh, location of the converting factory is in Singapore and also in Vietnam. Of course, our company also thinking for more beyond than uh, years ahead. So probably uh, there, there will be probably there will be a chance in having converting factory, for example, in Indonesia. As far of the uh, uh, food, uh, oh sorry, uh, wood forestry product, it will depend on the system that they implement. As long as it can fulfill our requirement with the highest uh, uh, quality standard, because in the end it will need to uh, fulfill the product for the food safety. So that is why, in also answering uh, why we are using the FSC as the certification standard, because it is an independent and also globally uh, uh, key stakeholder promoting and also providing the certifications. Daniel. Thank you, Daniel, with C4. In all your products, uh, you use plastics elements as well. How do you calculate your carbon footprint for this component? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, Pa. I might not answer your question in very detail level, so I will try my best to elaborate it. Of course, there are around 20 to 25 percent of the other than uh, paperboard base component. It is a polymer and also uh, aluminum. So this is also our goals to achieve as the one that I said in the beginning, 100 percent renewable uh, product or renewable uh, component. So, of course, we have some formula, not just in our operational, but also across the value chains in having some certain of standard for the global uh, gas greenhouses uh, emissions and also for the climate impact. That is why 
we are approved uh, among the workshop in UN and also other key stakeholder for the science-based uh, target approved. This is why we are trying to reduce our climate impact in the uh, environmental, uh, uh, reducing the environmental footprint. Thank you. Thank you, Pareza. Yeah. <laughs> now we are <coughs> moving into the issue of bioenergy and Ibu Sonia from ICRAF is going to talk to us about this. Thank you very much, Robert. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to be here to share with you um, the information and the summary of the uh, bioenergy workshop that we um, organize uh, jointly between the Swedish um, Energy uh, Agency, C4, and also ICRA uh, last February. So this was the uh, title of the workshop, is the Developing Science and Evidence-Based Policy and Practice of Bioenergy in Indonesia within the context of sustainable development. So uh, the co-organizer was uh, two uh, national agencies, which is from the Ministry of Environment uh, and Forestry and also Ministry of en uh, Energy and Mineral Resources, together with uh, Swedish Energy Agency with Paul and Tim with Ibu Ingrid from ECRAF and Dr. Himlal Parar from uh, C4, also another university, uh, KIT, KTH, which is the uh, Swedish university. This was happening in 14 of February in 2017. It was well uh, attended by uh, private sectors, by the government people, by uh, academicians and, and others. So um, basically, just like pa Viratno mentioned, uh, this one for the uh, national energy policy is also an, uh, setting an ambitious target. Uh, in 2014, the target was 23% of the total energy will be coming from new and renewable energy by 2025. If we see the trend up to now, basically we are not sure how this will be achieved by the, uh, 2025. Uh, within the uh, groups uh, at that time, uh, we identified the challenges uh, for wide implementation and uptakes of bioenergy. Uh, of course, the first one is the high uh, financing and investment requirement, which is not yet, not quite yet there yet. Uh, and then uh, the guarantee of availability of feedstock. Also infrastructure, for example, electricity grid is not there yet. And then also there's uh, some knowledge gap there. Uh, there's because of the lack of integration between research and industry as well as other stakeholders in bioenergy development. And then uh, very importantly, regulation and policy are not very much uh, accommodating yet. And then uh, as part of the supply chain, there are still lack of clarity in land tenure and spatial planning. So there are several sort of issues uh, 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 for pushing this bioenergy into wide implementation. It's the supply cha chain, partly is because of the uh, land tenure, and then an issue of uh, value chain because of the uh, infrastructure is might not be there yet. And also financing basically is a big uh, problem. And then uh, there are several enabling factors that are necessary to be there. Uh, we identified at that time uh, financing in, uh, instrument is necessary, including low interest loan uh, for bioenergy development, subsidy for biofuel, special uh, allocation fund for rural energy development, profitable business models uh, and others. And then uh, we also identify that incentive is a key factor. Uh, incentive, incentive system can be promoted by uh, government to producers through mechanisms where all factors involved get benefits. And then several opportunities to be sought. Uh, uh, there are three partic uh, particular factors there. The first one is commitment from the government required fund uh, long-term research and development on bioenergy, and then uh, potential for aligning bioenergy technology with existing uh, oil refinery that is there yet. So it's not completely uh, developing a new system, but also aligning with whatever existing. And then uh, last but not least, I think this is also 
um, related to what Pak Wiratno said earlier, potential uh, to utilize degraded or marginal land for biomass product production that can reduce uh, pressure on arable land and uh, native forest. So basically, social forestry can play a big role in terms of uh, uh, the interfacing uh, this with uh, bioenergy. So uh, what are the ways forward in the short or medium uh, term? Uh, in 2017, there's already pair press, Praturan President 22, uh, on RUEN, which is Master Plan of Energy at the national level, Rencana Umum Energy Nasional. And within that uh, RUEN, uh, it also mandates provinces to develop what they call RUET, Rencana Umum uh, Energy Daerah, uh, which is their master plan of energy at local or regional level. Several of provinces are there, uh, already starting to develop that, but some of uh, many of the provinces still are, uh, are on the process. Capacity is still need to be built in terms of developing a good master plan. And then uh, we also see uh, in the short medium term uh, sustainability, or sustainability of palm oil based biofuel need to be uh, promoted. Uh, in particular, competition with food security needs to be addressed. And then uh, bio develop, biofuel development through sustainable land use and governance needs to be promoted. And then uh, the last one, which I think is uh, very important, is efforts for ensuring uh, energy security should be part of green development at sub-national level. So basically developing or identifying by energy options uh, along with green growth planning uh, that take into account uh, development, uh, local development needs, uh, resource availability, potential suitability for tree and crops, land use and forest governance should be uh, there as part of the uh, entire uh, medium, uh, medium term plan at the regional level. Um, and this will lead to uh, for the provinces to be able to develop some macro indicators for jurisdictional performance. I'll just take an example from uh, South Sumatra here. So basically, they are at the, the polygon, small polygons is village, uh, villages in uh, province of South Sumatra. Uh, the dark uh, polygons basically are those areas where uh, access to grid electricity at the village level is very low. Yeah. So uh, you, you see there, there are areas where uh, certain uh, villages which is a uh, very lack of uh, access of uh, grid electricity are uh, clumped together. Uh, there's about 311 villages uh, has more uh, than 20% of household with no access whatsoever to electricity. And also there is high uh, coincidence, partially between areas with low land use profitability, remoteness uh, with low access to electricity. So within the green growth uh, plan, master plan that uh, we developed together with uh, the local partners with the uh, government uh, in, the, at the, uh, in South Sumatra province, uh, we, we try, I don't know whether you can see that clearly, but we, we try to identify the areas which are suitable for particular bioenergy species, uh, which are also uh, coincidence with the uh, land that is available there, and uh, also with the areas where uh, there are still lack of access to electricity. So in particular, we saw there are uh, um, uh, several species there that are uh, quite potential. Uh, in this area, there are uh, Rumput Gajah or, or Penny Setum uh, Purpureum is uh, identified to be uh, potential there. There are potential for Nipa and Sagu. There are some potential for bamboo uh, for electricity, potential for Nyamplung, and also those area where um, some um, paddy rice cultivation is uh, quite large, rice uh, bioenergy from rice straw is also um, being seen as being uh, potential. So having this uh, in part and identified uh, in terms of uh, you know in the in terms of in indicative map such uh, like this, basically can be uh, used to develop the master plan for. Um, RUEN for the uh, master plan of uh, uh, energy uh, uh, and also can the performance in terms of how it contributes to green growth, how it contributes to development, how it actually contributes to um, environmental impact can be 
uh, measured uh, at the jurisdictional level. So I think within this, uh, mainstreaming this into a uh, medium development plan actually then would be able to promote bioenergy uh, to, to, to the implementation stage. And here are the workshop recommendations at the, uh, uh, at the, at the short uh, term, basically, from the point of view of evidence-based uh, uh, policy. Yeah? The first one is uh, we suggested uh, that workshop with multiple stakeholder participants uh, is necessary to be taken place uh, soon to seek ideas on bioenergy development and the roadmap, uh, including uh, in increasing capacity at the provincial and local level uh, in developing a uh, master plan and then piloting. And then the second one is bioenergy fund supported the uh, government in the long term should be there uh, to uh, actually accommodate uh, the link between uh, uh, industry and also uh, research and uh, technology. And then the third one is research consortium or, or partnership in the long term should be there yeah, to, to foster national industry for producing equipment and materials. And then uh, the, the last one is demand assessment for bioenergy, which is still a big question mark at the moment, needs to be researched. I think that's all. Robert, thank you very much. Thank you, Busan Yang. <laughs> we have one quick question for Ibu. No? Thank you. And our last speaker for today, I mean, for this part of the seminar is uh, Pairi is going to talk to us about peatland matters. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to uh, share with you what we did uh, last Thursday on uh, GLF, Global Landscape Forum, on the uh, topic called the Pitlands Matter that conducted in May 18 in Jakarta. Um, in the GLF, in the Pitlands Matter, we uh, basically discuss three things. First is uh, why Pitlands Matter. The second one is uh, the science behind the pitland, and the last one is uh, making progress with pitland. This is the uh, why pitlands matter. First, is the, uh, it is source of uh, life, not only for human beings, but also for plants and animals. The second one is uh, pitlands provide food, water, and even livelihood for million million of people surrounding the globe and also as, a, as you look at this as a orangutan it is a home for threatened species uh, orangutan this is a picture actually coming from uh, south uh, kalimantan that uh, orangutan losing uh, habitat due to uh, forest conversion to well, there. And the last one, uh, why pitlands matter? Because pitland play a critical role for climate change mitigation. Very, very important to understand the role of uh, pitland in uh, climate change mitigation and action reducing uh, uh, climate change. So the science uh, behind uh, pitland, it is uh, mentioned as uh, pitland is a black goal for climate change mitigation because stocking a lot, lot of carbon is 10 times compared to the uh, mineral soil. If we don't understand the role of pitland, then it's quite difficult then to, uh, to mitigate the climate change. The second one is people and pit. We also talked a lot uh, last uh, week how many people, how the uh, livelihood of people depend on pit. So it's, uh, it is good to conserve uh, a pit, but also as, uh, in some area, pit becoming a 
uh, economic sources for people. People planted sagu there. People also uh, doing uh, oil palm on pit. So how to understand this? The livelihood of people on pit. So we discussed a lot. We have uh, we had uh, communities to express their voice, their uh, interest on pit. Also, as not least, uh, in Indonesia uh, during 2015, the fire disaster that killed uh, 19 people is uh, 43 million of people exposed to smoke haze and billion billion uh, economic loss due to a fire. World Bank estimated a 16.1 billion US dollar loss because of a uh, fire in 2015. So um, how we we uh, aware of this kind of uh, of science behind the pit? If we don't care, don't taking care of of pit, then pit could become a disaster for us. And also, we uh, during the uh, GLF uh, pitlands matter, we talk, discuss about the financing, sustainable pit management, because it's, it's important. It's uh, uh, understanding without um, good financing, then the sustainability of pit is quite difficult to to achieve. Yeah? And also, is, uh, we only we only work with the uh, um, local community, then the uh, the impact, the, the scale is not as big as we also working with uh, those who understand the financial mechanism. So it's, it's the, uh, there's uh, school children who exposed to fire in 2015. Uh, this I took with my own camera in, in Bengkales, in Rio, in uh, last March 2015, when the uh, the pit has uh, already uh, provided uh, smoke to us. And the last one during the uh, GLF, we had plan master call it making progress. Here we uh, I talk about Indonesia, um, in particular, what is uh, is important to to understand that the uh, partnership between public, private and people is mass yeah. because here um, in the top BRJ Spanasir uh, he was with us is 2.5 million hectare of pit land need to be restored yeah. it needs a lot of money and we, I uh, involved in the uh, government uh, creation of what we call grand design for fire prevention we need a three billion US dollar for three years in order to restore the pitland. It's a lot of money. So it's, uh, it is impossible that the government alone can provide money. In the, sorry. Can I give back my presentation, please? In the bottom is the uh, call it the uh, uh, fire prone villages with a 10.5 million hectare that also need to be uh, handled correctly. So both we need to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, three billion US dollars. So partnership is a must. The second one is uh, through the incentivizing for people, particularly smallholder, to uh, uh, practice agriculture without uh, burning. But again, so we need the money to uh, incentivize them at least. And also we talk about the infrastructure development, something like a canal blocking in order to to wetten the, the pit because restoration is uh, simply needs uh, rewetting the, the pit. We need to revegetate the, the pit as well as the uh, economic development. Also law enforcement. Law enforcement is a key. A lot of uh, judges, a lot of uh, people, police, sometimes do not really understand very well the, uh, the, the, the law 
about environments that we need to uh, strengthen the law. And the last one, the policy measures. So uh, in Indonesia, we now say debating, a lot of debating between private sectors, NGO, academy, ac academia, on the uh, government regulation number 57, 2016, on the uh, call it a pitland ecosystem uh, protection and management. So the debating how to use a pitland. It's, it is debating between the interest of conservation from a lot of NGOs and also the interest of uh, economic development coming from uh, not only uh, larger enterprises but also uh, smallholders. How to combine, how to harmonize those interests. Also it's uh, important to, uh, to uh, underline the, uh, what also is uh, being a huge debate in Indonesia on the EU Parliament resolution. Even Terry mentioned that uh, forest sustaining agriculture, but uh, Indonesia received the consent from EU that uh, oil palm is um, threatening the uh, rainforest. It's oil palm and deforestation of rainforest. So it's nice uh, the government tried to uh, um, put appropriate uh, response to uh, the EU parliament. Just a lot, uh, this is happening in Indonesia in particular, that I inform. It's, it's good that uh, science provide insight to government, to private sector, to community in order to take appropriate measure in the future. And the last one, I like this uh, picture. We, we were in uh, Dompas, Bengkalis, Rio. Uh, I have a uh, minutes of project called the uh, uh, political economy of fire and haze, and one activity is uh, legal drafting, how to have uh, appropriate law at the provincial level. So we uh, draft the local law and got uh, many uh, concerns, also messages coming from the ground, discuss with the local community. And uh, during the discussion, sometimes we uh, did a canal blockade and also um, planting sagu in order to uh, really uh, provide uh, concrete ideas how the restoration, how the uh, um, fire prevention is, yeah? and sometimes also the, to win the people heart to support our our program in endorsing uh, um, local law at the uh, provincial uh, level because. It is important for our perspective that the uh, restoration and fire prevention is not necessarily depend a lot to the national government, but also the uh, local government. Thank you, Rebet. This is my last uh, slide. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. <coughs> uh, now, um, the king and queen are planned to arrive on the campus at 3 p.m. Uh, they will go straight to the DG residence and there will be a tree planting ceremony at 3.15. There is a coffee break outside for the people who want to go out and have a coffee. If you go out, please leave your belongings here so that you will smoothen the security when you come back. I know that ladies don't like to leave their handbags and people their handphone, but think about it. And uh, if you don't want to go out, you are free, free to stay here. But there is a coffee break outside and you have to be back here at 3.